Şimdi birinci oturumun ilk sunumunu yapmak üzere Realop Platformu CEO'su Sayın Clarissa Marowski'yi kürsüye davet ediyorum. Sunum başlığımız Avrupa Birliği mevzuatı. Hello everybody and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, what I'd like to do is the Vice Minister's very interesting speech touched on learning from Europe, perhaps. And in Europe, we've had significant legislative changes regarding circular economy and to some extent deposit return. So what I'd like to do at the beginning of this conference is walk you through all of the big legislative changes that have occurred in Europe and talk a little bit about them. And hopefully this will inform your process here in Turkey. So let's begin. So first of all, very briefly, Reloop is an international association comprised of municipal and local government and provincial government and state government, as well as businesses and the NGO sector. We have a common vision of the circular economy and we work towards that vision. We focus on five different issues. Yes, one is deposit return systems, but we also focus on reusable systems, including reusable packaging, improving general collection and sorting systems, recycled content, and finally, um, measurement, and having effective and meaningful measurement, which I'll get into a little bit later. So let's talk about what is happening in Europe. Um, I came to Europe, I'm a Canadian. I came to Europe in 2015, right at the very perfect time when there was significant changes happening. And here we are four years later and I'm gonna tell you what happened. So to start with, just to give you a very basic uh, understanding of how the European Union works, there are about half a billion people represented in the European Union comprising of 28 member states. And the way uh, the government is set up in Brussels is there are three bodies of the government and the commission is the executive branch and it's the commission that does all of the work to initiate legislation and they also um, ensure that the legislation is implemented and they have all of the various ministries or director generals underneath um, the commission that do all the work. So DG Environment would be doing a lot of the work around the circular economy package as well as uh, the in DG growth. Then on the left, we have the parliament, which is of course many, many people, 750 people from 28 member states elected in the European, legis in the European elections, uh, many, many languages, many different political parties, and they are responsible for, they're a co-legislator. And they co-legislate with the council, which are represented by the 28 member states. Ultimately, the um, ambassadors sit in Brussels representing the needs and the wishes of their own member state. So effectively, both of these bodies come together, they review the, and the legislation that was released by the commission and they fight it out and they talk about amendments and at the end the legislation only goes through when both parties have agreement. So, before I get into what has happened, I'll just tell you quickly on plastic carrier bags because I know you addressed it in your speech, Vice, Vice Minister. Uh, we have existing uh, legislation it was an amendment that took place which basically says that um, there is a, a reduction goal of 90 lightweight plastic bags per capita by 2019 and that goes down right to a 40 bags per capita by 2025. So this is a binding goal in the packaging directive and it, it suggests certain measures for member states to take place in terms of reaching the goal, which is a variety of national reduction targets, economic instruments, or market restrictions. Um, the other thing is that by December of 2018, you could not give away a plastic bag in a shop. You had to have a charge associated with that bag. So now all member states are required to introduce these policies. But it's not unique to Europe. Look at the world. I mean, these are plastic bans. These are plastic bans happening, and this is a slide from 2017. It is much more populated now. So you can see that Turkey is not alone in its fight against 
and controlling plastic bags because it's something that's spreading across the globe. But now let's go to Europe. So in 2015, the Commission at the time introduced the Circular Economy Package. And very simply put, because I don't want to get into too many details, it comprised of two things. One was a legislative proposal changing existing laws, updating existing laws related to recycling reduction prevention. And the second one was a communication specifically targeted at the circular economy, but really a focus on plastics. These are a very quick summary of the key legislative amendments uh, that took place and that were effectively published in May of 2018, so over a year ago. So the first is a cap on landfilling of no more than 10%. This is extremely aggressive and I do want to say that the idea is that it's not a shift from landfill to energy from waste incineration. It's a shift from landfill to prevention, reuse, and recycling. And the Commission has made it very clear in their communications that they don't want to see more investment in energy from waste facilities, and they want to also utilize existing capacity in those countries in Europe where there is overcapacity, countries like Germany, Netherlands, and Italy. So there is definitely a signal from the European Union that we have to move away not only from landfilling, clearly, but also from energy from waste and invest in more sustainable circular technologies and policies. The second is a 65% binding recycling target for all household hazardous waste, household waste by 2035. And then we have new packaging targets, and I've put them down here. This is for both 2025 and 2030. Of, I mean, they're quite ambitious, and along with the ambition that you can see here, for example, plastics is 50 and then up to 55%, in addition to a more aggressive target, is a new method for calculation. And I'll talk about that in, on the next slide, but the new method for calculation makes it even more difficult to reach these higher targets. And finally, another big important piece is about extended producer responsibility, whereby producers are made responsible both financially and or operationally to take back their products. They have set a minimum of 80% obligation by producers in a, with a new extended producer responsibility system or a minimum of 50 where a system is already in place. So right there and then for any producers in the audience, there is a major, there will be a major financial impact on all producers across Europe that are going to have to contribute more money towards getting those materials back and getting them back into the circular economy. So that is, those are the legislative amendments that are in place, passed, and done. And they're in existing laws that have been in, in place for many, many years. These are the new parts of the law. On the recycling calculation, just to make it very, very clear about this new point of measurement, because it's significant, effectively what they're saying is that now, all over the world, when we count recycling, we count the tons that leave the sorting facility and get shipped to another processor or a recycler. We know that those tons contain a lot of material that will not be recycled. Water, glue, contaminants, garbage, et cetera, et cetera. The new calculation method says, no, that's not where we measure anymore. We measure when all the stuff that you don't want is removed. And we call that, I put this up, this is from the new law. It specifically says if we look at glass, sorted glass that does not undergo further processing before entering the glass furnace. So if you know what goes into a glass furnace, you'll know that it's very, very good quality with no contaminants in it. That's the new point of measurement. And for plastics, it's even more scary. <laughs> it's plastics that are separated by polymer that do not undergo further sorting or processing before pelletization, extruding, or molding operations. So when we think of the plastics that are being shipped from a sorting center, that is not nowhere near the calculation that we're using. We're using a calculation that extracts out all of the garbage that we don't want. So you can see why it's a much more aggressive point of measurement, and it's much more accurate. And just so you understand how different it's going to be, when we talk about plastics, to be 
give an average of what the losses are, it's usually 30% less goes into molding, flaking, and uh, pelletization processes. So imagine you take your existing total, what you're getting now, and subtract it by 30%, and that's the real recycling rate. So it is very, very significant. Another article that was introduced, and I was glad to hear you mention reuse and the importance of reuse, um, is a brand new article which states that member states should encourage the increase in the share of reusable packaging. And there's nothing binding in here, but they do mention four ways in which member states can do this. The first is, of course, by introducing deposit return schemes. And I would say deposit return schemes on all single-use items or beverage containers, quantitative or qualitative targets, the use of economic instruments, for example, like placing a tax on a single-use package but not having a tax on a reusable package. And of course, the most aggressive and the most meaningful is to introduce a minimum percentage quota as a member state. So, they're not binding, but they've set them in law, and we expect that member states will, in the compliance, will uh, introduce, some member states will introduce real initiatives in law to support reusable packaging. And just in case you're curious, um, we're looking at data all around the world right now to do with refillables. This is the stats for Turkey. Um, clearly, we've seen from 1999, the red and green, the red and blue lines are single-use glass bottles and single-use PET bottles. The green line is refillable glass. So in 1999, it had over, you know, in 1999, it had 44% market share, and it dropped to 1% in the water market that we have today in Turkey. So that's a big, big decline. And of course, for every refillable bottle taken off the market, it's replaced by potentially five or six bottles during one year. So if you don't have the right system to collect all those single-use bottles, you have an exponentially growing problem. The beer market is a little bit more positive. It went from 59% in 1999 down to 20 to 47% in 2018. So there's there seems to be there was a it dropped a little bit, but now it seems to be leveling off. So now let's talk about the most probably the most meaningful in terms of beverage packaging uh, in Europe. And the Commission actually coming out of their communication they decided to pass a new law. And they tabled the law in May of 2018, so a year ago, a little over a year ago, and it's called the Single Use Plastics Directive. And it is known as being one of the fastest moving legislation ever on environment in the European Union. And by Christmas, it had already been agreed upon by the Council and the Parliament, which shows you that it is a priority issue for member states in, in Europe. And this July it was published. So what is in this single-use directive? Uh, the first, there's, I'm going to focus on four key things very quickly. The first thing is it sets bans. It bans specific single-use products from the European marketplace. This is the list of products that it bans. And if you want to understand and the definitions of them, those specific definitions, what's in, what's out, are being worked out right now. But the, this list is in law. And we have some governments in the world that are already looking at this and saying, we're going to do the same thing. In my own country of Canada, I was happy to hear our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, tell uh, Canadians about six months ago that they want to copy this list in Canada and ban these products in Canada as well. The second thing has to do with extended producer responsibility. Now, we know we have extended producer responsibility on packaging, of course, and electronics, but this directive is suggesting that they put extended producer responsibility in place for products not typical, like 
um, tobacco products with filters, wet wipes, which is what you wipe your baby's bum with, um, balloons, uh, lightweight carrier bags. What does it mean? It means the producers of these products will have to pay for collection, transport, treatment, and litter cleanup costs. This is the first time that producers have been tagged with having to pay for litter cleanup costs. This will be significant. What are the costs? The method for determining the costs are going to be worked out over the next, I think it's 18 months, but this is definitely moving forward. Number three. Number three is Article 9 sets a target for the collection and recycling of plastic beverage bottles, 77% by 2025 and 90% by 2029. And then it further suggests to member states, you can achieve this by introducing a deposit system. Or if you really don't like deposit systems, you can set high targets for producer responsibility schemes and they can try to do it without a deposit system if they so choose. I would argue it's a, to reach 90% without a deposit system. I'm not quite sure how you would do it, but I know it would be extremely expensive. Uh, so we have these high targets. I should also say that there has been support from the industry. Um, we have voluntary commitments that were made by the European Federation of Bottled Water at the same time that the Commission released the draft law. Um, so that's, that seems to be supportive of industry. And also, just to clarify, when we talk about plastic beverage bottles, these are bottles with a capacity of up to three liters, including the caps and the lids. There is also, the fourth thing, is there's some product requirements, which is, of course, very important for beverage producers. The first is that the cap and the lid will be required to be attached or tethered to the bottle. And this is in a direct response to finding caps and lids on beaches. They want to make sure that the bottle and the cap stay together. And the second one is a recycled content mandate for member states of 25% for our pet by 2025 and 30% of all plastic in plastic beverage bottles by 2030. This recycled content legislation is, as far as I know, the first significant legislation on content design in the world. So it'll be very interesting to monitor the progress of this and to, in particular, see how they're going to introduce reporting systems at a European level, and that will be decided in the next two years, two years or so. Um, again, on recycled content, we've, we've seen the industry step up. Again, the European Federation of Bottled Water, who's here today, also came out with a goal of 25% content uh, around the same time. So we're seeing support from the industry. And we've seen many com companies, many companies have made voluntary commitments to introduce more recycled content in their bottles. So it should be no surprise because there's been so much public pressure around marine litter with a focus on beverage containers. This came out when the council and the parliament were negotiating the single use directive. It was done by Break Free From Plastic. They audited, they picked bottles from beaches all over the world and looked at the brands on the bottles and they came out with this. This is emotionally uh, it's, it affects politicians emotionally, and I think this is a big part of why the European Union went so far with their single-use directive, because they were emotionally impacted by something like this, and the photographs that we've all seen on Facebook and on the internet. So as I wrap up, I want to quickly do a scan, a global scan of where deposit is around the world, and then throughout the day you'll hear more and more about how to design. So this is a summary of the 10 member states in Europe that have deposit return systems. This is the collection rate and the recycling rate for plastic bottles. As you can see, there's a median and a mean of 90%. So it doesn't come as a surprise 
that the commission would have made 90% the target. Because if 10 member states can do it, why can't the other 18? About the caps, we were curious about the caps. So we went to deposit return operators and said, we're looking for information to understand, do caps come back with the bottles? What's the story with caps? And what they told us collectively, I think there were five that responded to me, including one in America, it was consistent. And the consistent message from them was that approximately 90 to 90% 90 of the bottles that come back have their caps on. So when we have a target that includes bottles and caps, it's nice to know that deposit return satisfies that target as well. And there's the sources of information. So let's look at Europe. Here is a map of Europe. In dark green are the countries that have deposit return and the year they were introduced. And in light green are all the countries that are coming on board in the next few years. Of note, Slovakia just passed their law in the parliament two weeks ago. Uh, we hear that um, Latvia is in the midst of third reading uh, in the parliament now, and even France is um, looking at passing enabling legislation, a larger circular economy bill, uh, probably at the beginning of the year, and the secretary, the, the, the government there is, seems to be very interested in introducing a deposit return system in France, which is 65 million people. So there is a lot of activity on deposits across Europe. In Australia, I think Australia will probably become the first continent on the planet that has deposit from coast to coast to coast to coast. Um, we've seen the introduction in Queensland, New South Wales, we're going to see the introduction in Western Australia, and we understand that Victoria will probably come on board as well uh, in the next few years. USA has about 10 systems, they're all very old, they all require modernization, some of them are collapsing because they're just not being properly administered. I've put a point on Oregon. Oregon is the one state that has actually modernized its system. It has increased the deposit level, it's expanded it, and it's hit 90%. So if America can do it, folks, anyone can do it. And finally, Canada, um, we have deposit return throughout our country. Unfortunately, it's state-based. Uh, it's not a national program, so we have different ones. But we do have up updates happening in two parts of the country, in particular in Quebec, where I'm from, 8 million people. They are finally, after 15 years, modernizing, expanding, increasing the deposit, and also introducing wine and spirit glass bottles. So we have a lot of changes happening in the world, and I hope this has helped to give you some foundation, and I hope that what they've done in Europe informs your work, and I thank you very much and I wish you the best for the rest of the conference.